Have you ever uh, been uh, part of a surprise party? Yeah, anyone here ever been, you had someone maybe threw a surprise party for you or you were the recipient of a surprise party? Um, I've never had a, I don't think I've ever had a surprise party, so someone should throw me a surprise party sometime. (laughs) Um, Have you ever had had a surprise at a party? Um, In our our, uh, first year in Perth Andover, uh, we were celebrating Ruthie's first birthday, uh, and we were, had all of our family there to visit, and it was wonderful, um, and uh, one family member, I won't say who it was, was responsible for looking after her for a few minutes while Julia and I went and got the cake ready or something, I don't know. We said, you're in charge, please keep her safe, and um, that person uh, didn't quite fulfill their responsibility effectively, and Ruthie ended up putting both of her hands on a, uh, a hot uh, f- a fire pit, metal fire pit, and burned both of her hands. Just They were just blisters. It was quite terrible. Quite a surprise. Quite an unpleasant surprise. So that was probably the most surprising thing that's ever happened at any birthday party or party that I've ever been to. The scripture today that we are going to be reading Uh, is not a surprise party, but it's a dinner party where a couple of big surprising things happen. And it's an opportunity for Jesus to tell a story, a parable, uh, to teach an important lesson about grace and forgiveness and gratitude and loving people on the margins. Uh, I'll admit that this is a story, uh, we're going to be in Luke 7, by the way, um, and the series is Parables, the stories Jesus told. This is a story that I didn't know all that well um, before today. I mean, I've obviously read it. I've read the whole Bible. Uh, get a little gold star for that. Um, but uh, I, so I've read this story, and I've, I'm familiar with it, but I've never really, like, studied it. And when I got into this story today, this week and really studied it, it, um, it was really, I was surprised at how much was there that was really interesting. So I can't wait to share it with you. Uh, the, the title of the message is Two Debtors. This is Luke 7, 36 to 50. Now, uh, let's read it, and then uh, I'll give you a whole bunch of background on it. So Luke 7, and the, the, the actual text will not be on the screen, uh, but uh, you can follow along if you have a Bible with you. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. A better translation is reclined at the table, or reclined to eat. And we'll talk more about that in a bit, too. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. And then she knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. And then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him, invited Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. (laughs) Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Uh, Go ahead, teacher, Simon said. And then Jesus told him this story. Now here's the parable. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces of silver to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled, canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil, to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. 
but a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said amongst themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. (laughs) Okay. Wow, that's such a good story. I can't wait to, to talk about it. Okay, so Jesus arrives in this town, and he's a person of religious interest, right? I mean, he's been going around preaching. He's a rabbi. He's gaining followers, gaining disciples. Um, and so it was normal for him, for him as a person of religious influence and, and interest to, to receive an invitation to dinner at the home of someone who was influential in the religious community in that particular local area. And so this local leader... Uh, who invited him over for dinner was a man named Simon, a Pharisee. Now, there's lots of Simons in the Bible. It's like the most common Bible name, so don't get him confused with all the other Simons. And we have a Simon. Don't get him confused with our Simon. Um, but this, we don't know a whole lot about this Simon other than what we read in this story. He's just a, a Pharisee um, who invited Jesus over for dinner. Um, let's talk a little bit about Jewish dinner parties of this nature in the, in the first century in Galilee. If, a, if it's a wealthy person who's hosting the dinner party, and it seems that in this case this was sort of a, a, a higher class person, um, dinner would be held in the, in the uh, courtyard of the home. So they would have their homes uh, would be built around a central courtyard, which was sort of an outdoor area, and then all of their private rooms were around the perimeter of the courtyard, and the courtyard would touch on the, uh, the main street. So there would be a gate, uh, out, right out into the main street from the courtyard, and then their uh, rooms would be around the courtyard. So in this central area, this courtyard area, is where they would host, host things like these dinner parties. And this was a, sort of a, a semi-public space, uh, because they would leave the gates open so that people walking by on the street could, could stop and peek in and see what's happening and watch the, the proceedings, because you know, this is sort of a, a local... Uh, per, this is a person of interest that's come, and, and they could even actually, if the courtyard was big enough, come right in to the courtyard and just sort of walk around the perimeter uh, of, of, the, of the courtyard and, and observe. And so there could have actually been a, cr- a crowd um, gathered around the, the walls of this courtyard uh, observing the dinner party. So that's kind of important. It helps it make sense of, of how this woman shows up there. Uh, <clears throat> So the nature of the gathering, uh, of, of gathering like this was, was such that the guests would actually recline at the table. So they would lay, <clears throat> I practice this at home by the way. So they would, <laughs> I got a pillow here too. So they'd have a pillow and they would get right, they would, I, I, I don't understand how this is comfortable, but they would lean on their elbow, their left elbow, and their feet would sort of be behind them, their knees would be bent, and then they would eat, you know, take the food from the table and eat like this. And sometimes they would even, I saw pictures of like illustrations. Of, they would even go on their bellies, like girls at a slumber party, and they would eat. So this is so their feet would be behind them. So that again helps you make sense of how this woman could come up behind Jesus and and wash his feet. The tables are set up in a U shape, um, so that servants could come into the center of the the serving area and uh, and serve from there. So if my visual wasn't cutting it, here's a, an illustration I found as well, that kind of shows you what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, these were also men-only gatherings. Women were not allowed. So again, this woman, we're going to talk more about all the things she does in this scene that are quite uh, controversial. Um, We also, we have our own, so they had all these these social norms, all these social uh, courtesies that they were supposed to follow. We have our own, of course, when we have, when we invite people to our homes, when I go to visit people in their homes. They almost always offer me coffee or tea, and, and tea I can, I can handle, but the coffee, no thanks. Ugh, gross. I don't understand how any of you people like coffee. I've said this before, um, and so I'm just trying to reiterate that I hate coffee. Um, <laughs> but it's a nice thing to do to offer it, okay? If you're hosting a guest in your home, there are simple acts of hospitality that are normal in our, co- our culture, right? Offer them a, a place just to sit down, you know, that sort of take their coat, you know, these sorts of things. And the first century Roman world had their own set of social norms and, 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 and polite uh, courtesies around, uh, around dinner. And three that are relevant for our story is that if you came into a, a dinner party at someone's home, you were greeted with a kiss. 
and, and men would kiss men. I mean, the Baptists would not be happy with that. Um, but uh, it was, they would do that. Okay, so it was, uh, they would just, they, it was a way to greet each other. They would uh, recline at, at the table, and, uh, and then uh, typically a servant would come behind you once, you once you're reclining, and they would get a basin, and they would wash your feet, because they had pretty nasty feet walking around in their sandals in that desert land at that time. Okay, and so that was a, a courtesy. And then the third thing was that a little bit of olive oil scented with some perfume was, was either given to you that you would then apply to your own hair. This is, sounds weird, but this is what they did uh, to kind of as like a, a little perfume for your hair, or they would, someone would, all, would do that and rub it into your hair for you. And that's a sign of hospitality. So it's anointing with oil, that's what they're doing. And that has religious significance and all sorts of things, but it was also sometimes just an act of hospitality. And so if you were attending a dinner party of this nature, you know, sort of a higher class party where you're reclining and there's servants and you're in this courtyard area um, and there's, you know, a, a guest of honor, all these sorts of acts of hospitality would be assumed. And so if they were not performed, it would be considered a very significant, very rude oversight. So that's some cultural background. To the, that sets the scene. And I said that there were two big surprises. So the first big surprise at this dinner party was that Jesus, who was this guest of honor, wasn't offered any of these basic acts of hospitality. So something was going on here. What is going on? Now, do you think that, that Simon, the host, that he just was forgetful and forgot to do these things? Mm, no, 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 no. If you're having a very special guest over to your home for dinner, you know, someone who's very well known and, and is a, a pers- really a guest of honor, uh, and have them over for a meal at your home, you don't just whoops, you know, forget to do basic acts of courtesy like greeting them when they arrive or, or picking up your dirty laundry off the living room floor, you know, that sort of thing. And so what's most likely here, what's most likely is that Simon intended to use this gathering to actually embarrass Jesus, to publicly shame him. Uh, hey, Jesus, uh, how, we're having a bunch of friends over. Why don't you come and join us and be the, the guest of honor? <laughs> you know? And then Jesus gets there, and it was social ambush. It, 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 was, it was a setup. Simon and his pals don't actually want to honor Jesus with a meal. They want to, they want to embarrass him. They want to, the neighborhood onlookers to see Jesus publicly shamed. Real nice fellas. All right, so that's the first big surprise. They didn't do any of these things that, 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 that the host should have done. The second big surprise, and this was really shocking, is that this woman sees what's going on. She sees this very intentional effort to, to insult Jesus happening in real time before her eyes, and she steps in to correct the mistreatment. Now, this is shocking because, first of all, she's a woman, and this was a no girls allowed party. And, and not just any woman, but this was a woman of reputation. A woman with a particular reputation for sexual indiscretions. The word sinner, in this case, uh, implies sexual sin. Now we don't know much about this woman. Some speculate that, this, that her name is Mary because it's very similar to a story elsewhere in the Gospels uh, about uh, uh, Mary of Bethany doing a very similar thing. But... I think this is a separate incident. It happens in a different time in Jesus' ministry. It's in a different location, so it seems like maybe this sort of thing has happened on multiple occasions in Jesus' ministry. Uh, so this unnamed sinful woman with a, a shady past who has a public reputation uh, for sexual immorality uh, walks into the room. But here's the thing. Something has changed in this woman's heart and life. Evidently, there's been an encounter with Jesus. The story doesn't tell us that. There's no record of that in the Bible. But we can, have, we, we can make a safe assumption that prior to this dinner party, she has previously encountered Jesus. Perhaps a, a few days earlier, she heard him speaking and was drawn to his, his grace and love as a woman living on, on the margins of, 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 of polite society. Uh, she was attracted to uh, to uh, this, this offer of grace, this invitation of God's love for even someone like her. 
Jesus was offering her hope and, and transformation and, and a fresh start. So the seeds of faith had begun to grow in her, and some degree of transformation and healing had begun. And she had experienced the mercy and grace of God through Jesus. She had experienced his forgiveness, and it was beginning to change her life. This was all something that had already started in her, we can assume, uh, from a previous unrecorded encounter with Jesus. But even though her life is already beginning to be changed by the grace of God, she's still on the margins. She's still seen as a bit of an outcast by the many people who couldn't see what God was doing in her heart, who were just looking at the outside and, and, and thinking about her past. And then here she is on this evening watching the party unfold along with others from the community and she witnesses this mistreatment of Jesus, this Jesus who she loves. And instead of just standing there and, and, and watch him be humiliated, she decides to do something about it. She decides to right the wrong. She decides to, to, to do an act of love and justice. So she musters up the courage and she crosses social boundaries to correct the mistreatment of Jesus. Now, women weren't supposed to even talk to men who they weren't married to, but here she goes a step beyond and she touches Jesus, which is, again, something that was just so taboo. Um, she approached Jesus, she knelt down behind him as he was reclining, and she began to wash her feet with her tears and her hair. This re also required that she loose her hair. And again, loose hair in that culture for a woman, that was a sign that you had loose morals. And so here she is washing his feet, she's kissing his feet, she's rubbing them with scented oil, you can imagine to the many people observing this take place that they're seeing this as a pretty sexually charged thing. This is promiscuous. This is flirtatious. This is overtly sexual. I mean, this, so this is quite a, a, quite a thing. This is quite a surprise for the party. Now, we know that her actual intention was not anything of that nature, but this is what people were assuming and judging as they watched this woman who had this reputation. But her actual intention was twofold. It was, it was to correct uh, the, the mistreatment of Jesus, as we've talked about, but it was also, and maybe what, more so, because this is what Jesus emphasizes, it was to express her love and gratitude to Jesus for his grace. We'll talk more on that in a minute. So, she had a bad reputation, but good intentions, and she's judged for her past. She's judged as, as trying to seduce Jesus rather than show him love and respect. And Jesus is judged for allowing it all, maybe even perceived as enjoying it a little too much. And let's read verse 39. So we'll go back to this, the text here. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. As, as uh, uh, a teacher, uh, uh, Gary Burge, and he's a teacher author, I really, really like him. He, he puts it, as he puts uh, it in his teaching on this moment, he said, this is the moment that unmasks the hostile intentions of the host. So if at any point you were thinking, well, maybe this host, he just was forgetful, and we're assuming too much that he really had bad intentions. No, he had bad intentions. Uh, he's thinking here, and it's not clear if he's thinking this out loud or saying this out loud, or if he's just thinking it in his, in his, in his head. Some people have different opinions on that. But he, he, he's thinking, if Jesus really is this righteous man, if Jesus really is this prophet, as, as, as so many people are going around saying, then he wouldn't allow this woman to do this. Rather, he would expel this woman for touching him and doing all these things that are inappropriate, in their mind, inappropriate. To Simon and his Pharisee friends, a true man of God wouldn't dare allow such immodest behavior in his presence. Now, let's take a pause from the story. Have any of you met people with that kind of religious attitude? That whole holier-than-thou kind of thing? People look down on you and, and question the sincerity of your faith because of some behavior in your life that they judge as unbecoming of a Christian? 
Well, if he really were a Christian, he wouldn't be drinking that beer, let me tell you. Well, she must not be a real Christian. She was wearing a skirt. Well, some Christian he is. I saw him coming out of the tattoo place. Oh, that pastor listens to Pink Floyd. We need to pray for him to repent and turn back to Jesus. I didn't make that one up. That's a real one. You might not fit the mold of the stereotypical conservative evangelical Christian, and that's not such a bad thing. Jesus didn't fit the mold. This woman was a sinful, this woman with a sinful past didn't fit the mold. They broke the mold. They dismantled the rigid religious legalism of, the, of their time. Jesus was a rebel. Simon and his religious friends were sitting in judgment of this woman and sitting in judgment of Jesus' response to her. And I pictured them all in stunned silence as they watch at Jesus' feet, uh, as they watch her at Jesus' feet. But Jesus knew what was happening. Jesus knew what was happening. And this is where this parable comes into play. We're finally getting to the parable. This is supposed to be about parables, isn't it? Uh, Jesus brilliantly tells this little story that simultaneously defends the sinful woman and attempts to reach the heart of the judgmental religious man. So let's read that parable again. Verse 40, um, uh, 41 and so on. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? So the the story is a real simple one. Two people owe someone a lot of money. Uh, One of them owes them a lot of money, 500 denarii or 500 pieces of silver, and, and that's about a year and a half's wages. Okay, and then the other one owes a lot of money, but not quite as much, 50 pieces of silver. That's about a month's wages. And neither of them could repay them. Um, And so the very kind person to whom they were indebted forgave them both. And then the question is, well, who would be more grateful for that act of kindness? And Simon gives the right answer. I suppose, he says, the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Right. The, the, the greater the debt, the greater the gratitude, naturally. And then Jesus says to Simon, look at this woman. Look at how she has showered me with all the kindness that you failed to, to shower me with. Look at how she has been a better host than you. Look at how she has humbly served me. She is a person who has been forgiven of many sins. She's done a lot of messed up stuff in the past, but she's been forgiven, Simon. And that's why she's here now, showering me in love and honor, contrary to your rudeness, because she is so grateful for the grace of God that is changing her life and her story. And the Pharisees are all shocked by Jesus. And and, and these bold things he's saying, including that he's pronouncing forgiveness on this woman's sins. And, And that's the story. Okay, so now let's talk about about what we can take from this. I think there's, there's three big lessons for us today from this text. And the first is a lesson that we can take from Jesus, okay? And the lesson is on how to treat people on the margins. I have heard so many sad stories, and I'm sure you probably have heard them too, about, from people about how they have been mistreated, abused, hated on, neglected, and judged by Christians. So many sad stories from, from racial communities, from the LGBTQ plus community, from women, uh, from people who grew up in Christian homes but have now walked away from their faith entirely, not because of some problem with Jesus, but because of the so-called Christians in their lives and, and, and in their circles who have been so unlike Jesus in their hatred and their unkindness. I've also heard more stories than I can count of people who have been loved into the family of God by Christians. Story after story of how people on the margins, people with habits, hurts, hang-ups, addictions, mental health issues, bad reputations and messed up pasts and all that have found the light and life that Jesus offers through amazing Christian people who actually acted like 
Jesus. Jesus shows us how to treat people on the margins, people who don't fit the mold, people who don't obey all the rules. He doesn't send them away. He showers them with love and grace in ridiculously generous measure. The Bible says in Romans 5, where sin abounds, their grace abounds more abundantly. You got lots of sin, then you get more grace. This is how Jesus has treated us. God's grace is this this unmerited favor, this generous kindness that we didn't deserve we don't, and we don't earn. And this is how he calls us to treat others, especially people who have gotten tangled up in the weeds of the world. Simon and his religious cronies were shocked when Jesus didn't tell the woman with the sketchy past doing questionable things to get lost. Jesus welcomed the sinner. When people from all backgrounds walk into our churches, will they encounter Simon's or will they encounter Jesus's? I hope they will encounter Jesus. All right, how about a lesson from Simon? If you think you don't need God, you'll never really know God. The lesson from Simon is that a failure to recognize one's own need for God's grace results in a failure to experience the kind of new and full life that God desires for us all. If you don't think you need God, you'll never really know him. Donald G. Miller puts it this way. Those who feel that by their own efforts they have earned the right to the Father's presence, a.k.a. those who are self-righteous, never come into freedom and joy. Their faith is a cold, calculated, impersonal relationship. But the prodigals, those who know they are not worthy, who deserve only condemnation, and yet who find a forgiving welcome from the Father, are those whose love runs deep. In the parable that Jesus told, there were two debtors. Both were unable to pay their debts. One person had a a big debt they couldn't repay, and the other person had a huge debt they couldn't repay. Both were debtors. And that's an important point, uh, uh, part part of of Jesus' point in telling this story. Neither one could repay the debt. See, Simon the Pharisee didn't put himself in the same category as this woman. He definitely thought that he was a way better person than her, way closer to the Lord, way holier than her, when truthfully, there wasn't all that much difference. And there's a danger that we long-time churchgoers can fall into a trap of judging people who sin differently than us. We're all sinners. We're all debtors praying the same Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Let's be careful not to, to get like Simon, who, uh, who, who is someone who, to, to, peop, to become people who are so saturated in our religious life and, and religious culture and rules and traditions that our hearts become hard to our own need for God's grace and forgiveness. And then the third lesson is from the woman, the woman with the sinful past. And the lesson is, if you're grateful for God's grace in your life, show it. Show it. Show gratitude to the Lord. Say thank you to him. Worship him. Serve him. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus said of this woman, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. This, all these actions she was doing was because she understood the depth of her depravity and the greatness of God's grace that met her right where she is. And she was so grateful for that. She couldn't stand to see Jesus mistreated. She couldn't stand to see Jesus not respected. And so she poured out her tears and her alabaster jar of perfume on Jesus' feet and she kissed him and she said thank you and she worshiped him. And if you're in this place today and your sins, which are many, have been forgiven... This is a reminder to you to take some time 
to sit at Jesus' feet, to crack open that alabaster jar, and to show him much love. Can the worship team come back, please? This story, which includes a a simple but profound little parable of Jesus, is just, I just think, so beautiful. In this scene, Jesus shows us how to treat people that are on the margins with abundant grace and welcome. Simon shows us what happens when we fail to recognize our own sinfulness and as a result, miss out on the joy of knowing God deeply. And the woman shows us the appropriate response to having a huge debt of sin forgiven, to thank the Lord by serving him, blessing him, and loving him.